my name is Garrett and I am the founder of Ambition in Motion and I'm so excited. I'm so grateful to have you here for our first workshop. I'm so glad that you're here and I'm so glad that you've decided to invest in yourself to build a mentoring relationship with someone from your organization so then you can help amplify your own career prospects and opportunities to really help take your career to the next level. I'm really excited for you and what you're going to accomplish over these next four months. So during this video, I just wanted to give you an overview of what to expect for the program and how to prep for this upcoming workshop. Now this workshop's title is called Transitioning into a Managerial Role. So maybe you're in your career and maybe you're about to start entering into a managerial role, or maybe you've been a manager for a while, or maybe you're not a manager quite yet, but you will be. This workshop will be extremely insightful for you. You are going to learn a ton about management and how to properly manage somebody and how to not properly manage somebody. If you have any questions throughout this workshop, please post them in the comments section. So I wanted to give you first an idea of the timeline of the program. Tonight is the first workshop. So pumped about it. All of our workshops are, by the way, going to start at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Pacific, and any time in between if you're somewhere in between in the United States. Our goal is that you have at least three meetings with your mentor, but ideally you meet more. Ideally you meet more often than that. If you think to yourself, oh, I should wait, or I should wait for this to happen, or I should wait for that to happen, don't. Get on it right away. Build that relationship. I strongly encourage that because the longer you wait, the more time you're putting off from building a great mental relationship and the more time you're putting off from actually really seeing the results and being able to apply what we're teaching in these workshops into your life. So have multiple areas of support. Take advantage of your mentor. Start building that relationship. Now, those four workshops are the first ones on transitioning to a managerial role. The second one is determining when is the right time to pursue additional education or if it's the right time to pursue additional education. The third workshop is determining when is the right time to switch jobs. And the final workshop is on how to handle conflict in the workplace. So the really relevant topics, and I think that you're going to really enjoy these workshops and the guest speakers that we brought in for you to learn from during these workshops. We will send you a post-program assessment to get your feedback. So this workshop is going to be roughly an hour long. And we're going to cover a lot of topics on how to transition into a managerial role. And so for you, my focus is on how can you go about making the most out of this? Really, the best way to go about making the most out of these workshops is to interact with us. When I ask a question to you, the audience viewing this, answer it. Because here's the thing. I would rather you post your questions in the comment section because if you've got this question, I guarantee you somebody else in the audience does as well. So if we were to answer questions on an individual private basis, we're not really answering everybody's questions. But if you post your questions in the comment section, we can share this with everybody so then they can get their answers just like you got your answer. This program doesn't guarantee you a promotion or a new job. Really, the key is... This program's for professionals who want to take their career to the next level. Like we don't hand things out on a silver platter. Now, by the way, do these types of opportunities happen for the professionals that use this program? Absolutely. But you got to be open to it. You got to be willing to put your time in to go ahead and, and make the most out of this experience. If you're thinking to yourself, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to come in negatively, negatively or skeptically, you're going to get negative and skeptical results. I mean, it's the law of attraction. If you come in with a negative mindset, you're going to manifest a negative mindset. If you come in with a positive mindset, you're going to manifest a positive mindset. It's all about how you view this system, this workshop, this opportunity. So come in with the right idea, with the right mindset, and you can make the most out of this experience. I promise that. So I just want to set the expectation properly. This is a program that does not hand out things on a silver platter. If you work for them, you can absolutely take your career to the next level, but it's about applying them. It's about actively meeting with your mentor. It's about actively networking and actually doing what you can to make the most out of this experience. Ask questions, interact, take advantage of everything we've got for you, and you will get the opportunities you desire. I mean, that's what is, this program's here for. If you think like, oh, I'm going to do the bare bones minimum, I'm just going to kind of have just three phone calls and, you know, we'll keep them at the minimum length of time and I'm just going to attend the workshop, not take any notes, not really make any comments, not really talk to anybody about what I'm learning. You know, you're going you're gonna to get those types of outcomes. That's pretty much it. So I just, I really want to encourage you to make the most out of this program. Take advantage of it. Ask questions, participate and interact. Treat this program as fuel. Treat this program as fuel to help you get to where you want to be. If you're already burning, going strong, going hard, this program can help you get into the next level and accelerate. If you're barely burning a fire, barely burning an ember, and you really want to rekindle that and get yourself up, take advantage of it. Jump in. But if you think to yourself, you know what, I, you know, I'm barely burning this ember. I'm not really trying to, to burn this ember. Really, there's nothing there. 
uh, you know, the field can only do so much for you. So the point I'm making is come in with an open mind and a willingness to work hard and you can achieve what you want. I mean, have professionals use this program to gain a managerial role or negotiate a raise or build deep bonds with their colleagues or expand their networks? Absolutely. But did those outcomes come, come handed on a silver platter? No, they didn't. It's about how you can apply what you're learning in this workshop to make the most out of this experience. So I want to share with you a little bit about my background because I think that helps give some context as to who I am, what we're teaching, what we've learned, and why this information is relevant. Um, so for me, I personally needed mentors in my life. Um, and, and this might sound crazy, but from age 15 to age 19, I was a drug dealer. At the end of my freshman year at Indiana University, I got arrested in an undercover operation by the Indiana University Police Department, and I got five felony distribution charges. I was expelled from school, and I had no idea really what I was going to do with my life. It hit my life like a brick wall. I mean, up to that point in time in life, I thought success was you go to school, you get good grades, you get a job, and then you just kind of find yourself like as if it's as if it's puberty, it just comes and hits you. Um, and nobody that I had ever known that I ever thought was successful ever was a drug dealer. So I either had to accepting a failure or redefine my definition of success. So I, I chose the latter. And it was a great decision for me, kind of like back to the whole law of attraction thing. I opened my mind to what positively could happen from this situation as opposed to negatively. Um, so I enrolled in a program in St. George, Utah, after I got in trouble. And they exposed me to the power of mentorship, both on a personal level and a professional level. On a personal level, they were huge. I mean, they helped me come to grips with how I'd affected my family, my friends, my university, my country. I really didn't think that what I had done really would impact anybody or that anybody would care. And that was so wrong. And I really don't ever want to discount the power of personal mentors because personal mentors can really help you make some serious just strides and, and have some serious growth in your life because ultimately those personal mentors can help see you for you. And don't get me wrong. The professional mentors are amazing as well. And by the way, we can mix those two. They can both be personal and professional mentors, but I just, I really want to stress the importance of being vulnerable in a mentoring relationship. Just like I've been vulnerable with you right now, sharing my story, because I know that when you're vulnerable, you're much more likely to be attractive in that relationship. You're much more likely to build trust. I mean, shoot, you can't even build trust without vulnerability. You have to have vulnerability. So when it comes to building a mentor relationship, I hope me sharing my story with you has helped inspire you to, to be vulnerable with your mentor and in your mentoring relationship. And just to kind of finish out my story in terms of how I actually got here from being a drug dealer who moved to St. George, Utah. Um, about a month after living in Utah, I flew back to Chicago for the weekend to let my family know my life's getting on track. On that flight, I'm sitting next to a guy. I took a keen interest in who he is. I asked him questions, I took down notes, shared with him a little bit about me, but really I was focused on who he was and asking him questions and really learning about what he had to say because people love to talk about themselves. I was learning that through a book I was reading called Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And by the time we landed, he said, oh, by the way, I'm the director of ground equipment for SkyWest Airlines. And he offered me an internship doing financial analysis on the spot. Didn't care about my background. He decided to take me under his wing and give me an opportunity. And that was so crucial. That was so, that was amazing. Um, he didn't care that I might be going to prison sometime in the future. He didn't care really what my future looked like. He cared about me and he wanted to give me a chance. And that was so crucial. It helped me really take some serious strides in my life and my career. Um, about a year after living in Utah, I actually got very lucky. Um, while I was in Utah, I started a nonprofit to help young men and women who had made poor choices with drugs and alcohol and help them get mentors too, just like I had gotten mentored by that guy at Skywise Airlines. And the court system saw that. They ended up dropping my felonies to a misdemeanor conviction. Indiana University had decided to re-enroll me, and I started Ambition in Motion with the idea of how can I help people get connected with their careers. I mean, ultimately for me, my vision is a world where the vast majority of people, not a couple people, but the vast majority of people are excited to go to work. When they're there, their expectations meet reality. And when they come home, they feel fulfilled. I'm here to try to help you achieve that. That's all I do is to help serve you, to get you to where you want to be in your career. Because the more satisfied you are with your career, the better of a society we live in. And the more happy society is, the better everybody's lives are. I don't know. That's just my way of trying to make an impact on the world. And, you know, if you're going through this right now as a professional and you're thinking to yourself, like, what is my impact on the world? You know, it could be anything. But I think if you're consciously aware of that and think to yourself, I want to make an impact on the world, that's a great starting point. So the point is, 
be vulnerable and think about your impact, especially as it comes to, as it pertains to your story. Now, I want to talk about three keys to success for this program. The three keys to success for this program are honing your strategy, your story, and your state. Now, I said those in reverse order of importance. Your state is number one. Physically, what is your state? Like your physiological state. Are you like amped up? Are you ready? Are you good to go? Are you in such a good mood that you, you're going to take on the world? Or are you stressed out, uh, hunched over your computer, got bad posture, not feeling great? I mean, your first impression is everything. And when you're going to your mentor meeting or a meeting with anybody for that matter, and you're coming in with a bad body language, I can promise you, you are not going to have a good first impression and that will kill that relationship. It is very difficult to overcome a bad first impression. So fortunately, there are some things that you can do to help you get yourself into a positive state. And they take like 30 seconds because your emotions drive your emotions. Now, you might have had the worst day in the world. You might be thinking to yourself like, oh man, I got to meet my mentor right now. I don't know how I can do this. Here's something you can do to get yourself into a positive state. There's a lot of things you can do. You can do a power pose. You can fake smile for 30 seconds. You could fake laugh for 30 seconds. But what I like to do is I like to shake it out and I like to dance it out and I like to scream at the top of my lungs. So what I want you to do right now while you're watching this video, and I know it might sound crazy, you might be in your house, you might be in your office, you might be at work, I don't really care. Stand up, shake it out, shimmy it loose. Stand out, I want you to scream at the top of your lungs. Just go, yeah, just let it loose, let it out, let it go. And the reason why I'm telling you to do this is because you are releasing endorphins to your brain, getting blood flowing to your brain. What this does is it gets you into a positive mood. It takes you from wherever you're at and puts you at a 10. It gets you ready to go. And your physical body, your physiology, your body is saying, thank you, I'm ready for this, I'm ready to take on the world. Your state is crucial. So when it comes to a mentor meeting, get your state right. You're going to give a first positive first impression if you get your state right. <laughs> if you're screaming at work, good for you. Amazing. I'm proud of you. That's awesome. You know, people might think of you and look at you like a weirdo, but that's okay because this is not a coolness contest. This is about you making strides in your career and getting a positive first impression with your mentor and with anybody that you want to meet. Now, the second key is your story. Now, what's a story that you tell yourself? Do you tell yourself a story for why you won't be successful or, or for why you will be successful? I mean, your story could be, oh, well, you know, I'm an introvert, so I couldn't possibly be good at networking or putting myself out there or trying to get a raise or try to be a manager because, you know, I, I, uh, I'm just an introvert. Or, or maybe you think to yourself, like, I'm an extrovert. I'm crazy around people. I can't even handle it. I'm a word vomiter. I just can't even contain myself um, around other people. I couldn't possibly be good at networking or in a managerial position. If you tell yourself a story for why you will not be successful, you will not be successful. But if you tell yourself a story for why you can be successful, you can manifest that outcome. If you tell yourself a story, if you literally play in your mind how a situation could go the most positive way it could possibly go, you will get yourself to where you want to be. So I want to ask you right now, and I want love if you could post in the comment section, what is a story that you tell yourself for why you will be successful? Where do you want to go? What do you want to achieve? How are you going to do that? Lay out your story of where you're going. It could be the next three months. It could be the next year. I don't really care, but put it out there for how you're going to be successful. Share it with the world. Share it with your community here because what that does is it empowers other people to be vulnerable and share their story as well. I'd love if you could share your story of where you want to go in the comment section. Now, the last key is your strategy. So what is the strategy that you're going to do to help you get to where you want to be? Now, this workshop is all about how to transition into a managerial role. So the strategy is going to be all about how can you go about becoming a better manager. Now, take the skills that we're teaching in this workshop with our guest speaker. Take these skills and apply them. One of the things that I love to do when it comes to strategy is to set up a routine. So what is something that you can do on a regular basis to help you reinforce this skill that you're learning in this workshop. Because if you're just here in this workshop and you're just watching this video and you're maybe you're taking notes, like that might stick. But if you actually teach it to somebody else, that is definitely going to stick. Exponentially, you are much more likely to remember the information that you're taught if you teach it to somebody else. So what I want you to do when it comes to strategies, I want you to take what you're learning during this workshop and I want you to apply it and teach it to somebody else. This could be a friend, it could be a stranger. I don't really care but teach something that you learned that you thought was impactful and powerful to you. 
I love if you could do that because if you can, you're going to reinforce this information and this, this program, this workshop, this whole experience is going to be so much more powerful to you because you are reinforcing what you are learning. So the way that you can practice, find an accountability partner, teach them the skills that you are learning, something that you learn, and it could be anything. Like whatever nugget of wisdom that you heard from me or from our guest, teach it to somebody else. That will help you reinforce it. Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited for you to embark on your mentor relationship. And in this mentor program, I'm really excited to get started with our guest speaker. Welcome to our workshop this evening. I'm so excited to dive into this topic of how to transition into a leadership role. This is one of the most difficult things to do because so often we are a really great individual contributor. We've done really great work and then all of a sudden we get promoted to a manager. And we're like, yes, we're finally a manager of people. And then what do we do? Are we doing the best job we possibly can be? Are we transitioning effectively? We're here to talk about how we can do our best to transition into leadership effectively. We've got an incredible guest speaker with us this evening. We've got Mindy Hankoop. Mindy is the Chief People Officer of Time Clock Plus. She has risen through the ranks of human resources and is now an executive who has built and led the overall vision for the hum human resources at her company. Mindy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Garrett. It's a pleasure. So let's talk about transitioning into a leadership role. Why is it so difficult? Why is this such a difficult transition to make for professionals? I often say it's because, you know, if you just take a step back, just managing our own selves is difficult. So we're messy, complicated humans. And the moment you get promoted to a leadership role, you no longer are just having to manage yourself. You are now leading and guiding several other messy complicated humans. It's not that you've just been assigned computers that are going to be able to directly do the code that you fed to them. You are now responsible for a, for a group of humans, not just yourself. Totally. Or in sales or in any part of just becoming a manager. I think it's so easy. I think so often one of the things I hear frequently from many people is, oh, I've got the worst manager. They're not empathetic. They're not a good listener. They are not focused on me. They're not giving me direction or structure. And it's so easy to criticize, but it's a really difficult thing to mm. do. I think it's, it's, it's so easy to complain and point out all of the issues with people who are bad managers. Um, but it's so difficult to, to, when we actually are in the position, we're like, oh, geez, I might be swallowing my words that I had from a few years ago because now I'm in the position. And you think to yourself, am I doing a good enough job or like, is, is, could I be improving? And so I guess I'd love to learn from you. Have you seen scenarios where you've seen good management versus bad management? Could you share with us some stories as to what happened and, and how people learn from that scenario? Definitely. And I think that some people innately just gravitate towards being leaders and being able to have that emotional intelligence while others have more of that growth mindset and need the tools and resources to be able to build on the strengths that they may not realize that they have. And good managers, even with tools and resources, they just seem to be able to find that balance, to be able to understand how to take the storyline of the company of how does the company make money that flow of revenue and be able to break down that story to how it translates to their team and also to the individual and how does that individual either support maintain or drive the flow of revenue so that they know when they come to work every day what is the purpose they're adding to be able to add to that flow of revenue at the end of the day so that they are able to guide coach because the manager has done just such a good job of being able to tell that narrative and how that person fits into the narrative. You now have a frame within which that person can be autonomous and with the guiding and coaching of the manager is able to perform and be able to really be their best self and be able to do all the things that we want to do in a workplace. When we're hired into a workplace, we're hired because we're smart. We want to contribute. We want to add value. We want to be able to have a voice and be able to be heard and feel like we're making a difference. And good managers are really able to see that 
possibility within individuals and then be able to give them the right experiences, the right tools, the right nudges along that pathway to be able to not only help the person succeed, but also at the end of the day, their team and their company. And I think managers that I have seen in my 20 years of HR profession, I've definitely seen a lot of examples of bad and good managers. And when a manager doesn't have that balance, when they don't have that self-awareness, they often, I often find that they are overcompensating and they don't even realize it. They may have a fear of failure as a person, and that may show up in their interactions with their direct reports in ways that they don't even realize. Often when I go to that manager and we're walking through some issues that they're having on the team, it really, if you dig down deep, it's something that they think the intent that they're trying to deliver is right. It's just the delivery isn't isn't correct and is not being perceived in the right way or the delivery is at the wrong time. For example, you may have a manager that really has a difficult time with confidence and that really wants to please people. And so they think they're guiding and coaching by being the cheerleader and showing up every day and saying, yay, that was an awesome job. But if someone is hearing that every single day and is never hearing about the opportunities that they need to improve, that we all have opportunities and that person is never going to grow. You're stagnating the growth of that great person that you hired. And that person may then become, hey, I want to grow. I want to stretch. But without that guidance, they're not going to be given the opportunity to do that. And they'll go seek that opportunity elsewhere, which is really an unfortunate missed opportunity. But when you dig back down is because that manager felt like they were doing the right thing, but because of something deeper that they weren't aware of that wasn't showing up in their leadership. And so that's where with a lot of managers, when I begin that coaching work, it's really about, hey, let's dig back. Like, where, where are you coming at right now? A lot of managers get so just jump into the work that they forget about, how do I feel about that? Let me do a self-check because I, if I don't do that self-check, that I may show up in a way that I didn't mean to when I'm having that conversation or when I am presenting that idea. Wow. So there's a lot to unpack there. I felt like you just unloaded a ton of great wisdom. There are three really big things that stood out to me about what you just said. The first was talking about the why and the revenue correlation. I'm going to dive deeper into that uh, soon. The other was about the self-awareness to just realize when I'm trying hard versus when I'm actually coming through to people or getting through to people and where those gaps are. And then the third is more of a silly example of just giving too much praise on the site, uh, Step Brothers, and, uh, that, a silly uh, quote from that movie. But I'll start with the first one of just talking about the why. You talked about helping people understand how their role relates to the revenue outcome of the business. I think that is so critical. It is a topic not talked about nearly enough uh, there's a company called Zingerman's up in Michigan, and they essentially it's this idea of open financial books where everybody knows about what their role does and how that impacts the bottom line of the business. Because if we hide that from people, it's difficult for them to know if they're making a really big stride or impact within the business. And nothing is more deflating than when I work when someone works really, really hard on something to ultimately learn from their manager or from somebody else in the company that it wasn't like that big part of their job. It was like a, it was like some part that needed to get done, but didn't need to be div- dove into with this extensiveness that they've gone into. And now they're like, Oh, what did I just, what did I work so hard on this for? If it wasn't a huge part to us being better as a business and as a company overall. So I love that you talked about helping people understand the why. The second thing, was the self-awareness gap. And I I literally just wrote an article about the 360 degree assessments. And, you know, if there's a gap between our 360 degree assessment, which is essentially a gap between what we think of ourselves versus what our colleagues think of us, where are those gaps? And so often we see this with leaders where you've got an idea of, you think perhaps you're doing a really excellent job, but your colleagues are telling you, you know what, maybe not so much. And more often than not, it's because we've read all the books. We've gone through the training seminars. We've gone to the motivational speakers. We know theoretically what to do as a good manager, but when it comes to the implementation, it is not, it's not translating. And I love what you said about confidence. Sometimes it's a lack of confidence. Sometimes it's a lack of, of just 
you know, necessarily knowing what to do in the right situation. Sometimes it's the lack of knowing what motivates the people you're working with. And so we think something motivates us. And so we say it should motivate you too, because you work for us and everybody's like me, but kind of like love languages, we want to be loved in the way that essentially we, we love in the way that we want to be loved. But in reality, when it comes to our working environments, people want to be motivated in the way that motivates them, not in what motivates us. That was a jumbled, jumbled way of trying to convey that point. Um, but the other, the other component, which was the people who give too much praise, it, it becomes dull over time. It's also kind of like the person who swears too much. It's like you swear once or twice, it really has that effect when you drop like an F-bomb or a swear word or something like that. But if you swear constantly like you're a sailor, it's not as impactful anymore. It makes, it, and vice versa, when it comes to giving praise, it makes you, make me think of the uh, Step Brothers quote when uh, uh, Will Ferrell and John C. Riley crash um, their dad's boat um, after doing a music video. And they were like, so what did you think? And the mom who constantly gives out praise is like, I thought what you did to Robert's boat was atrocious. But I thought it was really ingenuitive and creative. And what you guys did was, um, was you worked really hard on it. And he's like, yep, that's what I was, I was thinking you were going to say that. It's, just, it's silly. I, I know it's a goofy point to make. But I think the, the point is, is that when we give out too much praise, it doesn't resonate nearly as well when it's more, I guess, specific and poignant. So I love that you brought up those points. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, so true. And... I think that it starts to fall on deaf ears and then that trust, you're not really building trust because you're not actually having real conversations. And I think what separates someone from being an okay leader to being that transformational leader is the level of trust that they have on their team, which I think only happens through many things. But the key thing is having those real-time conversations where you have opened the door, you're approachable, you are vulnerable, you are able to enter into a very meaningful conversations with your direct reports, and they're able to tell you how they feel. And that's never easy. But a lot of times, if you get to the root of feeling that may be tied to the work, then you're able to, what you're saying, really understand where are those people's fears, what might be holding them back, where are their strengths, where are they ready to take that next step, and then you're able to then make better decisions, and you're bringing that person along with you, with trust, you have a better ability to have the connection, to have the narrative, to say the why for them to truly understand. And then you have this team experience where you truly are together doing this. Yeah, I love that you brought up trust. Simon Sinek talks about this idea of psychological safety. And psychological safety doesn't mean that we feel like we're fearing for our lives but psychological safety is this notion that i can say anything i want to to this person without fear of repercussions like i can tell them the truth i can be vulnerable with them i can tell them the concerns i've got going on in my mind and they're not going to judge me for it they're not going to dismiss me for it they're not going to negatively impact me for it that is so critical that is trust psychological safety is this this feeling that I can share anything. And if we have that with those that we work with, that's so critical. And I think that's one of the biggest things that a lot of first time managers really struggle with is this notion that we are actually responsible for the psychological safety for those that we work with. It's not just like, Hey, I'll get my job done. You'll get your job done. We'll all be good, happy, go lucky. It's truly caring for them in a way that you've never needed to care for another person before because you work in a manager position. Yeah, exactly. And it's not just about the trust between you and each individual direct report, but have you built a bubble of trust for the team? And the role, the responsibility of that trust really is every individual on the team. It's their team. And how do they show up every day and how they behave with each other? And you're, you as a manager being able to see those interactions and being able to guide and coach at the right time, but building a level of trust where people can go and talk to each other and self-correct each other, that it's not just left to you, the manager, to have to step in and course correct. But when your team owns it, 
then you unlock some really great things and some really great effectiveness wins. That is awesome. So I would love to ask, um, how do you offer feedback? Let's talk about feedback for a second. How, I mean, when we have this trust, it makes it so much easier to offer feedback because we can be constructive without feeling like we're attacking somebody else. How do you offer feedback? That's a really good question because I think it's something that a lot of people talk about at a surface level, but then they go away and they don't actually do it because no one actually wants to give or receive feedback. It's one of those negatively charged words. You go like read all the research that our animal brains, our reptilian brains literally have been taught run away because they have so many negative examples in their life with feedback because none of us truly are great at giving feedback unless you've been in an awesome environment where you've had the great level of leadership and management that have created that culture of continuous feedback, continuous input. I actually love to, to take the word feedback out and put in the word input. I started a little experiment at some of my workplaces where we stop using the word feedback and we use input. Because at the end of the day, what is feedback? Feedback really is just giving ourselves data signals on what is or isn't working well and how can we work better together. By really kind of stripping back the mistake serious and the fear of feedback, I find that we're able to have better real-time conversations. Hey, can I give you some input? Like in that meeting, you know, I felt like this was going on, but you know, maybe that, that was just me. Maybe I'm just perceiving that differently. Maybe I'm in a funky place. Can we talk about that? It's about being receptive and open giving feedback i find that often it's so focused on the other person that we forget we play a part in that and so when i give input i always want to first take a step back and say hey why did that land on me weird why did i perceive that weird because maybe it's actually something that i need to go work on with myself maybe it was actually a me thing and not a that person thing um, or i can like once I do that self-reflection, I want to go and enter into that conversation with that level of trust at the right time. Maybe it's a bad time. Maybe that person just stepped out of a meeting and I know that took a lot of their energy. That's probably not the best time to have a good open conversation, depending on what it is that I need to give input or feedback on. So there's a lot of things just about, but you don't want to wait too long, right? Because then it's like a missed opportunity and it's about the right balance and the right cadence of let's check in. Is this the right time, but not too late? And am I open to exploring? Am I entering into a conversation? Am I asking questions versus dictating and telling? Is this truly a conversation where I'm inviting someone in, knowing where I stand because I've taken some time to reflect and entering into a conversation where ultimately my objective truly is like, how can we work better together? Because really at the end of the day, I want us to be better together. Ooh, so I love how you refer to feedback as input. I think that's a really great, a great term to call it. I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm a big fan of Radical Candor by Kim Scott. And one of the things she talks about was very similar to what you just mentioned was the importance of immediacy when it comes to input, as well as specificity. So giving very specific input to people about exactly what they did that you thought could be improved or things that you'd like to discuss further with them. And the importance of doing it immediately, because if we don't do it immediately, we're not pattern disrupting. And if we're not pattern disrupting, our likelihood of changing that behavior for the future is low. But I love the other thing that you talked about was potentially turning it back on yourself and thinking to yourself, is this something that I could have done better? It makes me think of sometimes, and it's interesting, I, I love to learn your thoughts on this. It sometimes makes me think of, think of conversations I have with my fiance, where sometimes I'll chat with her about her day and things are going frustrating for her. And she'll bring up these issues of, of something that's going on at work. And sometimes I'm, I shouldn't be doing this, but I'll, I'll play devil's advocate. I'll be like, well, could this person be tr trying to be sabotage you or could they be doing this on purpose to, to make your, um, work difficult for you or could they have their other motivations for that? And sometimes some people want to just 
be like, hey, I don't want to hear potential solutions. All I want to hear is just you empathize with me in this given circumstance, which is fine. But unfortunately, sometimes if we hear enough of that, we build up this armor of, of why we are right and they are wrong. And so when we give our input to somebody else, it becomes a barrage. We are barraging them with input. How can we focus on removing the emotion and just stating the facts and identifying specific and immediate things that someone can work on so then that action doesn't happen again, but at the same time, we don't barrage them a lot with a lot of other things. Yeah, I love what you were saying because there are so many unconscious biases that we all have. And it's so true. It's always someone else's fault and not our own. <laughs> and I think our brains are, you know, are trying once again to give it, keep us in survival mode. And so we're always trying to build up in the unconscious brain of why we're not at fault and why it isn't us. And so when we are like entering into conversation with others where there's been something that we truly feel there's an opportunity to improve, to get better, being able to check that unconscious bias first is only going to allow us to help enter into a conversation that truly is at the heart of improving the relationship improve versus fulfilling yourself from a selfish place and really wanting to help that person. And so by checking yourself and your emotions first, then we can truly make sure that this conversation is happening from a place of true improvement for the team or for them versus fulfilling yourself. And I think as leaders, those selfless leaders that truly are self-aware are able to enter into those conversations. And I think that builds on the trust, right? That helps your, if you're entering into these feedback conversations with your direct employees by just dictating to them what you think they could have done better, there, there's blind spots, right? You're missing a part possibly of the story that you don't know that that employee that was in that interaction maybe has been bullying the employee and that you don't know. There, that, and that's why coming from a place of, hey, I saw this fact. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? That doesn't seem normal. Like that doesn't, I haven't seen you show up in that way. Can we talk about that? What are some, how did that make you feel? What are some different ways in which we could improve this and, and allowing them to be part of the solution, allowing them to enter in where you're not just dictating to them because then they're truly not learning, right? They're just going and acting by actually thinking through together in a solution focused way. And it's also forward thinking versus something that happened and we're trying to recap it, very defensive. If you're just thinking about what's happened in the past, but by keeping it future focused, how can we together what are some things that we can do to make a difference here and then hold them accountable and say okay like next week let's check in on that and how did that work then it's more transformational you're actually helping that person giving them some keys and tools to actually improve that's interesting it makes me think of dr uh marshall rosenberg's keys to nonviolent communication where he talks about observation, feeling, need, request, and taking a lot of the emotion out of, or really taking a lot of like the other baggage that comes with the observation, taking that out of it and just saying it as it was like, Hey, I observed that you interrupted me three times during this conversation. My feeling is frustrated. Uh, my need is to have a work environment where both of us and anybody can communicate a point effectively without feeling like they're going to get interrupted. And my request is that if somebody else is talking, you patiently wait for them to finish before bringing up your point. And um, that's just, I don't know, one idea, but it makes me think directly of what you're just describing of the key to just stating the facts while at the same time, not just saying, Hey, I think you're a jerk because you interrupted me three times over the conversation. Like that's, that's got nothing to do with anything. And it just automatically puts people's defensiveness blinders up. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a battle and nobody wants that. Um, so, so true. So true. Um, I was just like, you made me think of one more thing was 
I think that with leaders, as they are having these conversations and you're building trust because you're having these conversations, you're taking a moment to actually hear from the person and hear their voice. I think there's something in there too, that if you've gained that trust and you're that vulnerable leader, I think there's power in saying, I, I'm also human. And so that landed on me. That made me feel this way, like own how that made you feel if that truly did make you feel a certain way and recognize, hey, that may not be what's going on here. But as your leader, I care about you. And I want you to, I want us as a team and for you to always be improving. And I want to take an opportunity to chat through this together. Yeah, I think that's, I love the idea of being vulnerable first. I'd love to take a moment to pause and ask the audience a question real quick. Have you ever been in a scenario where you got, bad feedback that was very emotionally charged and have you ever been in a scenario where you had good feedback where it was very this was the feedback what did you learn from it post in the comment section i'd love to learn both about the bad times and the good times post in the comment section i'd love to learn about that i love for everybody to kind of share and learn stories from other people in the program so mindy i want to ask another question around this same topic but it so often conflict comes from a disalignment of values. So you've got one person that thinks they're focused on this part of their work. And as the manager, you're focused on this part of their work and they don't, you, but neither one of you realize that the, the value systems are off. I guess how important is it for me as a manager's to, uh, goals to align with my direct reports? And if it's important, how can I go about doing that and really making sure that those conversations are had? Yeah, alignment is key. Alignment around what even is that person's role? What are they actually doing? How are you measuring success for that person? And have you had clear conversations around what that success is and what your expectations are? And then how, what are the team norms or what are the norms that for your individual interactions, for your one-on-ones, how you communicate? And that can really go back to preferences and people's strengths. And like, we all take in feedback differently and we all communicate in different ways and we all filter the world in different ways. So it's like, do you actually know how your people learn? Do you actually know how they process information? Have you taken the time to do a, a profile assessment such as like an insights or a disc to be able to see what are the team's preferences and their communication styles that can really lead to a deeper level of understanding and how you as a team want to interact. What are you, what are you signing up and agreeing to, to hold each other accountable for in order to be able to keep the trust on your team? And so that's where I really love, the, they use this in agile teams and agile is like a way of uh, a lot of engineering organizations work. It's a methodology. And one of the things that agile teams have are team norms. And it's something that that team signs up for that these are our values and our behaviors, how we are going to show up every day and behave. And then the team is able, when someone is off track, is not abiding by the team norms, they are then given permission to be able to say, hey, that's not alignment here, what's going on, uh, this is not how we agreed to show up and behave. And that frees you up because you've entered into a level of conversation of what does this team value? What behaviors do we value that build trust or tear it down that we want to commit to holding each other accountable for? And that's something that as a team, but you also want to have in your one-on-ones. I think when you are hiring someone new into an organization, you want to take that time to really set up that level of understanding of this is like, this is who I am as a person. I want to know how, I mean, how do you, who are you as a person? And then how are these two people going to, how are you going to best interact with each other so we can have um, these norms? I have a manager, when you're asking for examples, a really good manager he actually, on my first day, had this list of who I am and, and what are my quirks. I loved it. I was like, it was just very vulnerable, very open. This is who I am. And in my years of leadership, this is what I found that people find weird about me. And I love that he automatically is coming out and saying, I'm not a perfect person. Here's my weirdnesses. 
I wanted to give you a chance to kind of read these. And are there anything in here that are kind of like your key things that maybe drive you crazy? And let's talk about it. If any of these things are like personality traits that often push your buttons, let's talk about it so that we can in advance talk about and walk through, if this were to happen, what are some areas in which we can set up a level of agreement or behaviors that we're going to agree on that if this happens, this is how you'll let me know or how we'll walk through that together. I just love that because it's being able to be very transparent and being able to in advance not to assume and you're setting a level, a, a groundwork, a foundation of agreement to start that relationship. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's cool. I like the, uh, the being upfront about your quirks. But what if we have a manager that doesn't offer us feedback? Have you ever had a scenario where you just had a manager that just never really gave feedback? Is it possible to manage up? If so, how? Yes. <laughs> I read so many managers that were either fall in the category they just wanted to always give positive feedback. They were the cheerleader, I often find. And or they said nothing at all, which really leaves you as a, a vacuum. And then you start to fill in your own story. And as an individual, that could either be an over positive story. And then I may be going in thinking into interactions where I think I have the legit answer, I am awesome, when really I'm not, and I'm just set up to fail because I didn't have that guidance or that feedback. Or I could be overcorrecting and I'm low confidence and with the void, I'm feeling for myself the story that, oh my goodness, I'm not good enough, I, I'm not doing this right, I'm over second guessing myself, and then I'm slow to action because I am constantly overanalyzing my actions because my manager isn't feeding in anything. So I'm going to feed in the story as an employee. So in those situations, I have gone to those managers and I said, you know, leader, I absolutely, you know, love you as a leader, but the opportunity I want to grow and in order for me to grow, I want to learn from you. You have wisdom that I do not have access to. And I have this great career aspiration. And without your guidance, I'm not going to be able to get there. And I really need your wisdom and in order to check my blind spots. Because I'm not perfect. I, I'm smart. But I have a lot of areas that I can improve on. Can you please like, help me? Just give me some guidance where you think that I could really take it to the next level. I think that takes the pressure off of them because then you're reframing the feedback into a way that, hey, can you join me on my career journey and help me get to where I want to be? I want to be at X and I see you strong in X, Y, and Z in your career and your experience. I think you could really help me guide me to that. And without it, I'm not going to be able to get there. You're inviting them to join your narrative and be able to feed into opportunity and strength versus seeing it as a negative. You're giving them permission. You're granting them permission. I find then that the door um, for these managers becomes open and they're more willing then to step in and enter into that place of coaching and being able to give you the, the feedback, the data that you need to really take things to the next level. I love it. And that's a great thing. I mean, if you are in a scenario where you feel like your manager is not giving you enough feedback, give them that permission. Say, hey, you're an awesome manager. I appreciate everything that you're doing. But right now, I feel like there are opportunities for growth that I might not be hitting. And I would love your feedback to help me be better at my work. I think giving them that permission allows them to kind of take the gloves off or not just take the gloves off, but just allow them to just feel like, ah, oh, do I have to walk on eggshells? Do I just tell this person this thing? Yes, no, I don't know. But by saying, hey, you've got permission, like lay it on me. That's a good thing. It allows you, it will encourage them to give more feedback. But on the flip side, as a manager, as a leader of people, how do you ask for input from those that work for you, that directly report to you? I am always asking for their voice. So I, the, the leader that was prior to me, they 
really were just told what to do. They were given very specific tasks and they really weren't given the opportunity to voice their feedback or even have a voice. And so me coming in and asking, hey, what do you think about this? What are your thoughts on this? Because I may not have it right. I, I'm new in this organization. Just because I've done this for over 20 years doesn't mean it's right for this organization at this time. These are just ideas that I've seen work or I know have worked at other places. That doesn't mean it's going to 100% look like that here. And when they heard the fact of, hey, these are just ideas. These are all potential solutions but what do you think? You have knowledge of this organization that I don't have. You have strengths that I may be weak in. And as a team, you're going to be better together. This isn't my team. This is our team. This is the company's people team. Let's help each other find the best way. It was at first, the responses were, hey, well, what do you think? Or what should I think about this? Or it was a lot of quietness. Or it'd be like, hey, can I, uh, in a one-on-one, hey, you know when you asked us about that, here's kind of what I think, but I'm not sure. It was like toe-stepping. We had to like start with baby steps, being able to build that foundation. Now we're in team meetings where we'll have people being able to offer up their ideas or their thoughts and we'll have a really good, healthy conflict conversation, much like a Patrick Lencioni, who's also an amazing author of The Advantage and Five Dysfunctions of a Team, where he, I love how he talks about healthy conflict. And conflict is on a continuum of where it is, is and somewhere in the middle is where you want to be. Because not having conflict isn't good either, because you have a lot of passive aggressive behavior, because people aren't truly entering into being able to think about an idea and you could be heading down the wrong direction and someone could have helped you think about it differently, but because they didn't feel like they had the opportunity to speak into the idea, then you're just going down a pathway. I think as a leader, that's the other thing. When we started this conversation, as a leader, there are all the things that you have to balance. There's all the things that you have to do. The thing is, is you're not doing it alone. Now, as an individual contributor, you may have been alone, but now you have a team of amazing people around you that have their weaknesses and strengths. And those great leaders find what those strengths and weaknesses are. They find where their aspirations are, and then they align projects with the strengths or bring out the strengths that they see that that person may not see yet that maybe you yourself as a leader are weak in so that you then have a team that fills out the full, like, I like to say the full human body. You don't want to hire a bunch of heads. You also need hands and feet. And so you then as a team are greater than the individuals that make it up. I love that. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, you know, I think to even add to it is when you're asking for feedback as the leader, specificity is key. The more specific you can be, the better it, it, it'll be. Because ultimately, I think a lot of people, when you first ask them for input as a leader immediately, they're not going to give much. So they're going to kind of tiptoe because they don't want to offend you. Um, but I think the more specific you are about specific things, it's easier for them to separate that, that input to you about that specific action you took versus you as a person. It allows them, because I think a lot of people fear challenging or negatively impacting you as a person or somebody as a person as a whole, and therefore they avoid feedback. But if we can get very specific about, hey, I wanted to know, what did you think about how I performed this specific task at this specific time? What are your, what's, your, what's your input for me on, on how I did that? By making it specific, it allows them to potentially give you some constructive criticism without it feeling like it's challenging your character as a, as a person. Exactly. And you're taking the person out of it. And if you're explaining the why of why you're coming to the team for feedback, I think that also helps. It goes back, Garrett, to what you were saying earlier about the importance of saying why, helping understand the context. So you're going to them with specificity, like around what exactly am I asking for, but why am I asking for it? then I think that helps people also come in and have a better conversation about it. That's awesome. So I'd love to ask the audience a question real quick. What is one key takeaway you've taken away from this, this workshop 
with Mindy and I that you feel like you can apply to your own managerial abilities, even if you're not in a managerial role yet, or you've been in a manager role from a while. Is there anything new that we've discussed that, you know, has maybe caused you to think a little bit differently about something post in the comment section. I love to learn what was most impactful for you. Mindy, I'd love to, to just, I'd love to finish on like one final point. And it's body language. And I know that sounds like a silly thing to talk about, especially when we're in such a virtual world. But what is the role body language plays as a manager, both from ourselves as well as encouraging others to showcase positive body language? And it's ever more important virtually, guys. How you show up on camera is very different than in person. So that answer, how do you show up virtually versus in an office or in a room is also very different. Because when we go back into the office, we may have different levels of comfort around how close should we be when we're giving feedback. Each person also has a different bubble of space. And are we entering into that space or not? And being aware of what that is for each person. And also, how are you setting up the, the room in which you're having the conversation? Are you having a table between you and the person versus kind of being on the same side, which opens up more for conversation versus I'm dictating something for you? Are you separating yourself apart from the other per person in a way that is making you look more knowledgeable, more, or are you really be trying to be more relatable? Are you actually giving, there's also something about body language that says, are you receptive to hearing from me? You can have a very closed off, um, a closed off demeanor. I, I actually was a dancer and I thought about going into dance movement therapy. And there's a lot around how we move that ties to our, our subconscious. So we may have just had a bad day and we're slumping. We're just really tired. We may be holding ourselves differently. And if we're in a meeting with someone, they could perceive that in a very different way than what it is that you are intending to. And so it is important to be cognizant of how are you feeling and how is that showing up in your tone and in your body language when you're interacting with someone and at what level do you need to be interacting? I, I could have a whole separate conversation about this topic. Body language is so critical and you're so right because we communicate what 65% of all of our communication is with our body. Only 7% is with the words that we use. The rest is our vocal intonation and inflection. So I think that, um, yeah, there's a lot there. That's awesome. Mindy, I think we've covered so many really great points about just how to transition effectively into a leadership role. I guess the last question I'd love to ask you is how can our audience learn more about you? How can they connect with you? I know we're big advocates of LinkedIn. Are you all right with our audience connecting with you on LinkedIn? Yeah, I would love to connect with people on LinkedIn. You can find me as Melinda Roberts Honkoop, and you can just chat me or uh, follow me and reach out to me with any questions that you may have based on anything that we talked about here. I love being able to, to meet new people and love talking about this topic. Awesome. Mindy, this was great. Thank you so much for being here. Everybody in our, our audience, thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your night. See everybody.